Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot give up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks, receives. And everyone who searches, finds. For everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Our text for today's sermon is that Old Testament reading that Rachel read so well a moment ago. These next two weekends, the Zion Theater Group will be presenting the Broadway show Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Though our theater group doesn't do church shows, this play is a retelling of the story of Joseph, one of the patriarchs from the book of Genesis. It's a lighthearted, playful look at the life of a man who endured some incredibly tough times and later is lifted up to be the second most powerful man on earth. Joseph was the 11th of 12 sons of Jacob, born to Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. Joseph was Jacob's favorite son, And the story has it that Joseph was very handsome, which will be a problem for him a little bit later in his life. Being daddy's favorite, he was also a bit of a tattletale, which this too will be a problem very soon in his life. When Joseph was about 17 years old, his father had a special coat made for him, a coat of Well, the Hebrew word is not certain. Some folks think it means a coat of many colors. Some folks think it it means a coat with stripes. And some folks think it means a coat with large sleeves, extra fabric. Either way, our coat in the play has all of those, so we're covered. Now, Joseph's brothers had always been a bit jealous of him being daddy's favorite and all. So this coat thing really got their dander up. And to make matters worse, Joseph was what was called a dreamer, meaning he would have dreams that were visions of what was yet to be. Well, one day, Joseph rushed to tell his brothers of a dream he had just had, It was about how he and his brothers were gathering grain in the field, and in the vision, Joseph's sheaf of grain suddenly stood up very tall, towering over all the others. And all of his brother's sheaves of grain stood up too and bowed down to his. Well, you can imagine how well that went over. This really honked him off. Little brother, 
you spoiled brat, are you telling us that you are going to rule over us? And they despised him all the more. Another time, he had a dream where the sun, the moon, and 11 stars all bowed down to his star. Well, now this one kind of made the whole family mad because the sun and the moon were obviously mom and dad and the stars were the brothers. But this time it says that Jacob, Joseph's father, started to wonder if there might be something to these dreams that Joseph was having. But one day, Jacob sent Joseph out to the field to go check up on his brothers. The brothers saw him coming from a long distance away. And they thought, now's our chance to get rid of that meddlesome brother of ours. And they plotted to kill him. But the oldest brother, Reuben, Reuben convinced them not to kill him. So they came up with this alternate plan. And they, when he got there, they stripped him of his fancy coat and they threw him down into a nearby pit with no food, no water. And just to taunt him a bit, they sat down around the pit and ate lunch so he could see them. And they talked about the day. Well, about that time, along came some Ishmaelite slave traders. And the brothers saw the opportunity to be rid of Joseph without having to kill him. They sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And the brothers then took Joseph's fancy coat and they dipped it in goat's blood to help flesh out the story they were concocting. And when they got home to Father Jacob, they took the coat and presented it to them and said, Look, Father, isn't this your son's coat? A tragedy has happened. He must have been killed by a wild animal. And Jacob wailed in grief. Meanwhile, the traders sold Joseph to an Egyptian named Potiphar. Potiphar was the captain of the guard in Pharaoh's court. Now Joseph was a very talented individual. And finding himself in this situation as a slave, he threw himself into the task and he rose quickly in the house of Potiphar. And you remember that handsome thing? <laughs> Well, this is where that got to be a problem. You see, Potiphar's wife noticed that too. And day after day, she would try to seduce him. Yet, Joseph refused, saying that it would not only dishonor God, it would also dishonor his master Potiphar. So one day, while no one else was around, Potiphar's wife decided she would have Joseph right then and there. And she grabbed his tunic to pull him down to her. And Joseph bolted. He broke out of her grasp, took off running, leaving his shirt behind. Now this made Potiphar's wife very angry and probably a little worried that her intentions would be discovered. So she hollered out, help me! And she told her husband that this Hebrew slave that he had brought into their house had been trying to seduce her. Well, Potiphar blew his stack and had Joseph immediately thrown into prison and kept in chains. It was while he was there in prison that Joseph's gift for dreaming came into play. Two of his fellow inmates had strange dreams that kept coming back to them. And they came to ask Joseph about the meaning of these dreams. One was Pharaoh's baker. The other man was Pharaoh's butler. Apparently it was hazardous duty to work in Pharaoh's house. They both wound up in prison. 
But each man had an odd dream that they shared with Joseph. And Joseph explained. For the butler, it meant that he would soon be restored to favor in Pharaoh's house. For the baker, well, his life was soon to be over. And each of these soon came to pass. The story then tells us that Pharaoh himself was having an issue with some troubling dreams and couldn't figure out what they meant. Something about seven fat cows and seven lean cows. And his butler, on hearing about this, said, You know, I met this guy in prison. And Joseph was quickly summoned to Pharaoh's court, where the Pharaoh shared his dreams with Joseph. Now Joseph listened, and he told the Pharaoh that these dreams he'd been having were a warning. The land of Egypt was about to have seven years of good harvests, followed by seven years of absolute famine throughout the land. So he needed to spend the seven good years preparing for the seven bad ones. Pharaoh was so amazed by Joseph and his talents and so grateful for this warning that he made Joseph his vizier, his right-hand man, his second in command. So Joseph has now gone from the pit to the palace. He has become the second most powerful man on earth. Moving the story along a bit, this all comes to pass. The seven good years, and then the famine begins. Meanwhile, back home, this famine has now hit Joseph's own family. So Father Jacob sends his sons down to Egypt to beg for some grain And wouldn't you know, Joseph, as governor of all Egypt, the one that these boys had sold off into slavery to get rid of him, he is the very man they have to go to to get grain. But they don't recognize him. Because you see, by now, Joseph looks and talks and walks like an Egyptian. When the brothers come before him, well, Joseph immediately recognizes his brothers, but he doesn't say anything. Of course, he sells them the grain that they need, but he can't resist the temptation to play some games with them. And over the course of the story, he has them going back and forth between home and Egypt until finally, Joseph has his own royal cup placed in his little brother's grain sack as they're about to leave. And he accuses them of trying to steal it. And he says, the only way that this won't turn out badly for you guys is if you prove to me you were honest men and bring this father you have, Jacob, bring him back to Egypt and present him to me. And he keeps little brother Benjamin as a hostage until they return with the whole family. So the brothers return home once again and they tell dad about this crazy Egyptian ruler who insists if they ever want to see Benjamin again, the whole family has to go down to Egypt. What else can they do? They pack up and they go. And when they are all gathered in Joseph's presence... Joseph reveals himself for who he is. Think about that for a moment. Suddenly these brothers who were on their knees before the second most powerful man in the world, they recognize this is the same guy they set out to kill and sold into slavery. They are shocked to say the least. And you know they are terrified of what he's going to do to them for what they did to him so long ago. But Joseph is a different kind of man. 
Joseph reassures his brothers he is not going to take revenge on them for what they did. In fact, Joseph tells them, brothers of mine, what you guys meant for evil, God has used for good. If you hadn't sold me as a slave, all of Egypt would have starved to death. Brothers, all is forgiven. And the family is reunited, and there's a big happy ending, and closing number, ta-da! It's a great story, and I hope you'll go back and read it all, because this is a fast run through. It's Genesis, about chapter 38 through 45. Read it yourself. There is so much more to it. Now, in our Zion production, I get to play the old man in the story, the father, Jacob. And with this story of Joseph on my mind for the last several weeks, I started thinking, you know, this Joseph was a very resilient human being. He grows up in a household with 11 brothers who despise him. And he deals with it. He is sold by his own brothers into slavery. And Joseph puts his all into it and rises to be a trusted servant in an Egyptian court official's house. He's falsely accused and thrown into prison. There he builds relationships with his fellow prisoners and helps them out, which eventually brings him into Pharaoh's notice, and Joseph rises to become a very powerful man. Now that is a very resilient human being. He gets knocked down and he gets back up. And he always seems to do it with the best of attitudes. How? Because Joseph knows God. And each step along the way, he understands that no matter what's happening in his life in this moment... God is still with him. Joseph recognizes that even if his brothers and others betray him, God never does. God is faithful. And so Joseph is faithful to God. Joseph's great resilience is a byproduct of his faith, his relationship with God. Resilience. I think that's a word that applies to this congregation as well. From our early years as a, as a farm community trying to start a church under those trees over there when work was seven days a week from sunup till sundown, how difficult those days must have been. Holding together through the Great Depression and two world wars, coming through all of the various conflicts that regularly shake up Christianity as a whole. We were there. We endured. And we are still here. And there's something to be treasured in that history. Even with something as seemingly simple as this building process we're involved in, We have encountered difficulty after difficulty. But it absolutely amazes me how well this congregation has handled it all. When other churches would have descended into ugliness, (laughs) Zion Lutheran has taken each hit and said, well, that stinks. Now, what do we need to do? How long is it going to take? What's it going to cost? Let's get moving. It's incredible. We, as a congregation, are a resilient people. It's identity, part of who we are. Why? Because like Joseph and so many others before us, we know. We know God is here. God is still with us every step of the way through good times and bad. God is faithful to us. 
God is gracious with us. What else can we do but follow God's lead and be faithful to God and gracious with one another? Joseph's story is an amazing tale. I hope you'll all come to see it one of these next two weekends. And tell your friends and neighbors. And the story of Zion Lutheran Church of Holotus is also a pretty amazing one. Filled with amazingly resilient people who are grateful for an amazing God. Perhaps we can invite our friends and neighbors to be part of this too. Eh? What do you say? And to God be the glory. Amen.